Hi, this is Joe with Prep Agent. I'm here with my friend Beverly. Hi, Beverly. Hello. We're getting ready to pass our exam, but before we do, real quick, if you guys want to go to my website, prepagent.com, $40 full access for exam questions, audio files, ebooks, outline, vocabulary lists, crosswords, and more. Pretty good deal, right, Beverly? Awesome. I think so. And if you guys want to do a webinar like I'm doing with Beverly, send me a message. We'll see what I can do. And just so you know, this is recorded, so I could share this with other people in YouTube land. So if you're comfortable being recorded and you want to do a webinar, just say so. And if you don't want to use your real name, you don't have to. So Beverly could be Jane for all you know. So, <laughs> right? But you're actually Beverly, right? Yeah. Yeah. So with that being said, let's get started learning so you could pass your exam. Sound good? Yeah. Okay, so with that being said, what's the first question here you gave me? So you gave me a lot of good questions, and we're going to use them as the launch pad to do a lot of great learning today. So this first one, why don't you read it out loud? Which of the following is most frequently employed to assure titles to real property for a grantee? Which of the followers okay. most frequently... Okay, so what did you say the answer is? Uh, what are the options? Read out loud the options for the people who are just listening. A is certificate of title, B, title insurance, B, recordation of deed, and D, warranty deed. Okay, so which is the following is the most frequently employed to assure title to real property for a grantee? What do you think the answer is? Uh, B, title okay. insurance. B, title insurance, she says, and she is correct. So good job. So first one, you're on a roll. But if you watch my other webinars, you know I don't really end it there. I usually answer a question, and I start asking you harder questions about this subject. Yeah. Yeah, you're ready because you've seen my webinars before. <laughs> yes, I have. Okay. So I'll ask you, what is title? Title is ownership. Excellent. So title is ownership. So what is title insurance? Um, title insurance insures title. So you're saying title insurance insures title. That's like saying what is a good looking person? It's a person who is good looking, right? Yeah. So let's try and elaborate on that a little more. What is title insurance? Title insurance is, is to insure when you purchase a house. Okay. That what? That there is no, that, um, that you're the only person purchasing it. You're on the right track. You're definitely on the right track, right? It more has to do with the person selling it actually has what's called clear and marketable title. Okay. So you're definitely doing well. You get that insurance to make sure it's clear, marketable title. So when they look at the title insurance, you see this word come up, a chain of title. Do you know what that is? It's a history of ownership. Why is that important to know the history of ownership? So when you purchase the property, um, I don't know. Well, I'll help you, okay? So I'm selling the property to you, okay? Uh -huh. and Susan sold it to me, and then Bill sold it to Susan. Okay, that's the chain of title, right? Okay. But what if Bill didn't have the right to sell it to Susan for some reason? Then Susan didn't have the right to sell it to me, and then guess what? I really don't have the right to sell it to you. So that's what that chain of title is all about, to make sure it's clear, marketable title all the way through the process. And when you, hire, okay. when you hire title insurance companies, that's their sales pitch, that they want to say, hey, we research the chain of title, the history, better than the other title companies. We find those defects a little bit better, and we protect you against them. Okay. So what is an abstract of title? What do you think? Abstract of 
title is the summary of awesome. the title. Abstracts is summary. And just so everybody knows, that's not just title. You could hear these at the word abstract with legal documents, title. It basically means a summary. Here, so read that. This is the definition of an abstract of title. Can you read that out loud for everybody? A summary giving details of the title deed and documents that prove an owner right to dispose of land together with any encumbrance that relates to his property. Okay, so she said, a summary giving details of the title, deed, and documents that prove an owner's right to dispose of land together with any encumbrances that relate to the property. Encumbrance, that's an awfully big fancy word. What's that? Yeah. Encumber is, um, is it like a burden. Is that a burden now? It is. No, you're right. That was great. Burden it's a to the property. Perfect. What's an example of one? Um, a lien. Awesome. A mechanic's lien. A mechanic's lien would be one, for sure. Um, yeah. That's good. Liens, mortgages, okay. trust deeds, taxes. These are all liens. Can you have an encumbrance that doesn't have to do with money? Um, yes. What would be an example of an encumbrance that doesn't have to do with money? Like an easement? Bam! Perfect. You have been studying. Nice work. <laughs> an easement. Good. So now, hopefully, you answer the question a little insecurely at first, but as we talk about this, you're getting more confident because you understand what this is all about. You're like, oh, I get it with those encumbrance, it finds things like those easements, if they owe money, things of that nature. Yeah. What's a cloud on title? Cloud on title is, title is not clear. Right, just think, like a cloudy day. Yes. So what do you do when there's a cloud on title? What could somebody do? You would have to clear it. Right, so let's look at this, what a cloud of title is. The term of cloud of title refers to any irregularity in the chain of title. See, so I'm trying to use all these terms together. That would give a reasonable person pause before accepting the conveyance of the title. The cloud of title reduces the marketability because a prospective buyer is aware and the cloud will know that they are buying a risk of the grantor not being able to convey good title. So cloud on title makes things unclear because it's saying that person selling may not have the right to sell it. So obviously it's going to lose the marketability. Okay. So you could back out of the contract, making it voidable, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it says here, examples of cloud on title includes an address being misspelled, a deed of conveyance not done right, a mortgage lien, which is the example we talked about just now, a mortgage lien that hasn't been repaid or properly recorded. Um, so there's different things of this nature. Now there's something you could do when you see a, a cloud on title. Do you know what that's called? Quiet title. Bam. What is a quiet title action? I feel like you got the easy one wrong. You're getting the hard ones perfect. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you just had to ease in. Maybe you just had to get comfortable, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what is a quiet title action? It's to clear title. Here, read that out loud. An action to quiet title is a lawsuit brought in court having judicious over property disputes in order to establish a party title to real property or personal property, having a title of against anyone and everyone, and thus quiet any challenges or claims to the title. Okay. And Beverly, if I repeat that, don't think you're not reading it great. It's just my connection's a little better, so I may repeat some of this stuff for everybody listening. Um, okay. An action to quiet title is a lawsuit brought in a court having jurisdiction over property disputes in order to establish a party's title to real property or personal property having title of against anyone and everyone and thus quiet any challenges or claims to the title. I love that that's in quotes because... Very often, people think about these terms as such complex legalese. 
But if you put it in real terms, you do a quiet title action so that everybody's quiet, so people stop complaining about who owns it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the quiet title action clears the title and gets rid of that cloud on title. All right, and all that related to that title insurance, that abstract of title, and that chain of title. So it all works together very nicely. I think we're off to a good start. What do you think? Good. Okay. All right, next question. As required for contract validity, value of consideration may be A, the rendering of the service by one or both parties, B, anything which the parties themselves be to be of value, C, one dollar or more, or D, any of the above. Okay, so as required for contract validity, value of consideration may be the rendering of a service, anything which is determined to be value, one dollar or more, or any of the above. What do you think the answer is? Um, I thought it was B, anything which the party themselves need to be of value. Okay, so it was one dollar, not consideration? It is. Okay. But it's only one dollar, not really a value. That's what I thought. Okay. So it's D, any of the above. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Can I pay you, give you consideration in the form of a hug? If you wanted to. Well, if we both agreed upon that and you're like, Joe, you know what? I just need a hug right now. All right, Beverly, sell my house. I'll give you a hug. As ridiculous as that may sound, is that legally okay? Yeah. Yes, it is. And my point is, it's truly any of the above. Anything people consider a value. And here's the point here. Consideration is a legal concept which means something of value is given in exchange for something else. People often think it's money. Legally, however, it's the obligation each party makes to enforce the contract. There are two types of consideration, valuable and good consideration. Valuable is what you were talking about, money and things that can be measured. Good consideration can be a promise or can even be love and affection. And that's what I was getting at with that hug. Okay. It could be anything you want. Each type of consideration is sufficient to enforce a contract. Okay? Okay. So that's an important one. So that's any of the above. Okay, that last paragraph reads, a common misconception is that the good faith deposit in real estate is the consideration. What's the good faith deposit? What's that all about? Earnest money deposit. Earnest money deposit, exactly. And I wrote down that last slide that people often confuse that to be consideration. Why is that not consideration? Why wouldn't this earnest money deposit be consideration? Yeah. It was money. Right. It's money. But it's not really the paying of the money. Like, I could sell you the house and not keep that good faith deposit, correct? Yeah. Because that good faith, now every contract can be phrased differently, but that good faith deposit is really meant for what? To show that you're interested in purchasing the house. Exactly. It's to show that you're serious. That's what that good faith deposit is about. Earnest money deposit, good faith deposit, whatever you want to think about. Mm -hmm. And so people truly understand the nature of this. I'm going to ask you a question. You ready? Yeah. You're married, right? Yeah. Did your husband propose? Yeah. What did he do when he proposed? <laughs> what did he give you? I don't need to know the details. I'm feeling some bizarre story uh, that, that we don't need to know. Uh, 
me a ring. Gave you a ring. Excellent. He gave you a ring. What a romantic, awesome guy he is. Okay? <laughs> Let me ask you something. If he said, Beverly, you're the love of my life. I love you. Let's get married. And he didn't have a ring. What would you have thought? Like, he's serious. You wouldn't think he was serious, right, if he didn't have the ring? Yeah. You'd be like, absolutely not. I'm not marrying you. You'd be like, why? I said, I love you. I'm down on a knee. And you would have responded what? What did you say you would have responded? Yeah. No. If he didn't have the ring, you, that's not what you would have uh, said. If he didn't have the ring, ring, then I'd probably say no. He wasn't serious. Yeah, you say, I love you, but I don't believe that you're serious. Right? That's what you would have said. Yeah. And so basically, that ring is like the deposit on his love and affection for you. Okay. And the engagement period, we'll call it escrow, and the day you said, I do, escrow closed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you get the analogy here? Okay. So that good faith deposit shows you're serious, much like when your husband presented you that, that wedding ring that first day, engagement ring, excuse me. I hope it was romantic and beautiful, by the way. I hope it was. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Excellent. Okay, here we go. Next one. In Read the which of the following situations would an IRS section 1031 exchange not be allowed? A, the properties are not of a like kind. B, the exchange properties are both vacant land. C, one of the properties in a leasehold over 30 years, and D, one property is in California and the other is in Arizona. Okay, which of the following situations would an IRS Section 1031 exchange not be allowed? What do you think the answer is? Um, A. Perfect, good. The answer is the properties are not of like kind. So let's talk more about this. Do you know what a 1031 tax deferred exchange is? When the taxes are deferred. Okay, true. When, when you, if you're purchasing, uh, when you sell your house and you purchase a larger amount of the house. Okay. And you can defer the payment. Good. So... Let me clarify everybody listening here. A lot of people say a lot of this is not relevant to what you actually do in real estate. Not only is this relevant, but there's law firms and real estate agents who specialize in this and make entire careers out of dealing with this. A 1031 tax deferred exchange. So people really need to know this, not just for passing their exam, but as you move forward as a real estate professional. And it sounds like you got a pretty good idea of what it's all about. But let's nail it down a little more specifically. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. So let's start here. As we know, wealth is created by owning property and getting the equity and building your assets. Correct? Yeah. So the government likes the idea of people investing in real estate in the area. The more people invest, because when you invest in a house, it's your equity, it's your house. Therefore, you care more about the community and care more about the value of everything around it, correct? Correct. Yeah, so when everybody leases, you notice the neighborhoods aren't as nice as when neighborhoods are everybody owns. So the government wants you to own property. They don't want you renting. So when you go to sell your property, the government's not really happy. So what they're gonna tell you is say, hey Beverly, you're selling your property. How about you buy another one and you're like, all right, what's the catch? Well, here's the deal. You buy another one. That way we know you're not going to become a renter or, or anything. You become a property owner. You get one that's a little nicer. You make sure it's of like kind. Like you said, you're getting a residential house, get another residential house. And you don't have to pay the taxes on this sale. And you'd say, great, right? Now, people say tax-free exchange, but that's not exactly correct, is it? No, just deferred. It's deferred. Why? 
you don't have to pay the capital gain. Right. But my point is, eventually, you're going to want to sell a house and walk away with the money. It's deferred until that day. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So it's not like it's tax-free. It's not like you never pay taxes. But it's deferred. So you could take your money, put it into the next house, next house, next house. And I have a great short video on this. You guys can watch if you look up 1031 Exchange Prep Agent. And the details of this get pretty nitty gritty. That's why I have specialists in this. When you get a 1031 exchange, do you know how long you have to identify a property? Um, before you buy another property, I think it's like 180 days. You have been studying. So you're not exactly right, but you're pretty close. <laughs> it was 45 days to identify the property, which is the question I was asking. And then it's 180 okay. days to close that deal. Okay. But you definitely, you definitely knew what you were talking about there. Because you were like, I know 180 days has something to do with this. <laughs> so you could sell your house. And this is why people specialize in this. I see Beverly. She sells her house. I'm going to tell you let's do an exchange. And you want to do a 1031 exchange. The clock is ticking. It's not like one of these buyers who could buy something in 10 years. They have 45 days to identify one and 180 days to, to get the property closed in order to defer those taxes. And that's why it's great to work with people who are interested in 10 through 1 exchanges. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. How are you doing? Good. Good. All right. Let's read this one. The duty of a real estate agent to communicate an offer to the principal exists A, only with the respect, respect to written offers, B, whether the offer is in writing or verbal until the agency is terminated, C, only until there is written acceptance of the offer by the principal, or D, Except in the case of offers which include the condition precedent. Precedent, yeah. Okay. The duty of a real estate agent to communicate an offer to the principal exists. Okay, what do you think the answer is? Um, I thought it was B. B as in boy? Yeah, but I think it's A. Always go with your first instinct. I'll be? Yeah. Like when you get up in the morning, get dressed, you know when you put on an outfit you really like, but then you got a lot of time to sit around, like either your ride's late or you just have time, you change your outfit? Yeah. What ends up happening usually? You change. Then you go back to that original outfit or you're like, oh, that original outfit was totally better. Yeah. Because your first instinct is usually correct. So don't second guess yourself. And that's a big lesson for the real estate exam as well. When you're not sure of an answer, make sure you jot down what your first instinct was. Because if you go back to it and you're still looking at it and mauling over, you're still not sure, you want to default to what that first instinct was. So make sure you record what your first instinct is. If you doubt yourself, you can look it over again, but if you're still not sure, you want to go with what your first impulse was. Okay? Okay. So B, whether the offer is in writing or verbal until the agency is terminated. So let's talk about this for a second. The acronym of COLD will help you remember your duties in a fiduciary duty, fiduciary relationship, excuse me. I wish I could find a more witty little acronym there like when I come up with stud or dust or things like that, but this is all I got here. It's a good one. You like this one? Okay. As an agent, you must be A, accountable, C, care and skill, O, obey legal instructions, L, loyal to your client, and D, disclose all pertinent information. And that's where this comes in. If you look at this question, the duty of a real estate agent to communicate and offer to the principal exists. So you're disclosing what's going on to your, your principal because that's the your fiduciary relationship, correct? 
Yeah. It says nothing about enforceable agreements or closing deals or collecting money. It's just about communicating. So I pose this question to you. Is there ever a time where it's okay not to disclose to your principal? To my principal, no. Not really. At least not related to transactions like these. I mean, obviously you don't want to disclose yeah. personal info. But we're just talking about disclosing. So if you read this question carefully, you realize they're just talking about communicating to your principal what's going on and being on the up and up with them what's happening, whether somebody's writing or has a verbal agreement they want to set forth, you're just talking to them, which is why whether the offer is in writing or verbal until the agency is terminated. Does that make sense? And it's one of those simplify the question. Yeah. They're just talking about communicating. You ask yourself, yeah, you always communicate anything that's relevant to your seller. I mean, let me ask you this. If you're the seller and I'm representing you and a buyer says, hey, Joe, I'm going to offer Beverly a million dollars on that house. I'm totally going to do it. And I knew that. And then we're sitting here eating lunch. Will you be annoyed that I didn't tell you that? Uh, yeah. Exactly. So think it in those real terms. And I'll be like, no, Beverly, it wasn't in writing. What would you say? Uh, you should have told me. Yeah, it's like, I don't care if it wasn't in writing. The dude's got a million dollars. Tell, tell me about it. Tell me what's going on. You'd be like, well, I didn't want to tell you until it was in writing. And you'd say, hey, we're not talking about binding here. I just want to know what's going on. So spit it out, man. Okay. All right. That's totally how we talk to our clients, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question. Here we go. With regards to an oral listing agreement on real property, the payment of a commission to a broker is A, contrary to public policy, B, prohibited by commissioner's rule and regulations, C, permissible if the seller elects to do so, or D, illegal. So with regard to an oral listing agreement on real property, the payment of a commission to a broker is A, contrary to public policy, B, prohibited by the commissioner rules and regulations, C, permissible if the seller elects to do so, or D, illegal. What do you think? C. You said C for Charlie. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember that Sesame Street song where it goes, one of those kids is doing their own thing, one of those kids is playing a game? One of those kids doing their own thing. Which one it is, I can't say his name. Remember that? No. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> it's where you're supposed to find the odd man out. Well, I'm glad I remember it. Nice. I sang it perfectly, by the way. Um, so the gist of it is, and the reason I sang that song, is because you're looking for the odd man out. So let's say you really don't know the answer to this one. Okay? You're really confused. Yeah. Can you tell me what's the difference between B and D and A? A, B, and D. Um, well, it's permissible if the seller elects to do so, then the seller agrees. Right, so my point is, yeah, I'm sorry, what were you saying? Um, it's not illegal. Payment. So my point is, D says it's illegal. Well, if it's prohibited by the commissioner's rules or regulations, isn't that kind of the definition of illegal? Yeah. So B and D to me are kind of the same thing. And there's no all of the above option. And it can't be both of yeah. those. And then you look contrary to public policy. Once again, does that mean it's illegal? My point is A, B, and D in one form or another all say it's against the rules, okay? C is the only one that is clearly different than the other three options. Yeah. So by using our test-taking strategy, it's C. So I was trying to go over some test-taking strategy here, and I want you to look at it and say, geez, if A, B, and D are basically the same thing, and all three of them can't be the answer, it must be C. Do you understand my logic as you go forward to take your exam? Yes, I do. And now you understand why I sang that song? One of those kids is doing their own thing? And yes, it's, I remember that song. 
Yeah, Sesame Street. <laughs> okay. Okay, what do you think on this one? The loan to value ratio of the mortgage is a monthly payment as percentage of base amount of a loan, B mortgage loan as a percentage of down payment and closing costs, D mortgage loan as a percentage of assessed value, or D mortgage loan as a percentage of appraisal value or sales price. A. Monthly payments as a percentage of the face of the amount of the loan. No, it's the it's the percentage as relates to the sales price, the appraised value of the sales price. Okay. So there's not a lot of fun things I could do here other than tell you a loan to value ratio is literally the loan amount to the value of the home. But I'm gonna follow you up with some other questions here. Okay. What is a mortgage? A mortgage is a loan. Okay. Um, so a mortgage is that security for the loan to make sure you get paid. How many parties are in a mortgage? Um, two. Two. What are they called? Mortgage-er and mortgagee. Excellent. What's a trust deed all about then? The trustee has three. Excellent. What are they? Trustor, trustee, and beneficiary. Perfect. Good. So mortgage is a two-party system. Trust deed is a three-party system. Mortgage has the mortgage or mortgagee. Trust deed as the trustor, trustee, and beneficiary. Is it a lien? Are those two things a lien? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because uh, it's a loan that you are Because you, you owe oh, money. Because money, you owe money. Excellent. What kind of lien is it? Excellent. Why is it a specific lien? Because it's just that one property. Right. So if you don't pay, they take that one property. Okay. What would be an example of a general lien? So mortgages or trustees are specific liens. What would be an example of a general lien? A general lien is if it was on a couple of properties, one or two or more. Well, it's even broader than that. What would be an example of a general lien? Judgment. Perfect. Awesome. You've definitely been studying. And also tax lien, judgment lien, taxes, those are general liens. Okay. Is a mortgage and trustee a voluntary lien or involuntary lien? It's a voluntary Good. Because you obviously choose to get it. Whereas a judgment lien, you don't choose to get that. Yes. Okay, read this one. All of the following statements concerning deed restrictions are false except covenants in a more inclusive term since it includes conditions and equitable servitude. Okay. B, a violation of a condition can result in a forfeit of title to the real property. C, a private restriction must be for public health, safety, moral, and general welfare in order to be enforceable. A D, general speaking, a covenant is more restrictive and more costly for the owner of a property than a condition. Okay. So what do you think the answer is? Um, B. Nice. A violation of a condition can result in a forfeiture of title to the real property. Which leads me to my next question. You know about freehold estates and less than freehold estates, correct? Yeah. What's the difference between a freehold estate and a less than freehold estate? A freehold estate is like real property. Mm. Simple. No, 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 no. Huh? 
they both have to do with real property. So let me back up for you for a second. It has to do with time. A freehold estate is an undefined length of time. Less than freehold estates are defined lengths of times. So freehold estates are one you own. Less than freehold estates are leases. Okay? Yeah. Can you name different types of freehold estates? Okay. Um, a life estate. Good. Um, the simple estate and the simple the feasible. Good. So you said different types of freehold estate. So which one of these has a condition? Um, the simple the feasible. Good. What happens if you violate that condition? You can lose title. Right, you could lose the property. Okay, so feasible to feasible has something called a condition subsequent, where if you violate that condition, you could lose the property. And for those who are wondering, the types of less than free old estates are estate for years, periodic tenancy, estate at will, and estate at sufferance. Okay, do you know the difference between those? Which one would be like a month to month? Periodic tenancy. So we'll say period to period. Which one could somebody leave at any time? A state at will. Illegal in most states. Which one is the landlord suffering? A state for suffering. They do not leave. Deadbeat tenant. Okay. Yes. Nice work. think the customary procedure used to enforce private property restrictions on real property is a a judgment b an injunction c indictment or d a desist and refrain order so what do you think d is in dog or b is in boy d is in dog oh it's an injunction. Uh, okay, read this out loud. Injunction, a judicial order that restrains a person from beginning or continuing an action. So basically it's a court order telling somebody to stop. Stop what you're doing. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Those person Smith presented to broker as buyer power. Offer to purchase seller Jones real estate, accompanied by an earnest money deposit in the form of a personal note in the amount of $1,000. Broker Sanchez should inform salesperson Smith A. Without seller Jones' express permission, salesperson Smith should not have accepted the note. B. Buyer Fowler must be told that the note will have to be redeemed within five days of cash. The buyer bow should be told that this offer cannot be presented to Seller Jones. Or the Seller Jones should be informed prior to the sentence that the deposit is a commissary note. Okay, so I'm going to read that again because that's a lot there. Yeah. Salesperson Smith presented to broker Sanchez's buyer Bowers offer to purchase seller Jones real estate, accompanied by an earnest money deposit in the form of a personal note in the amount of $1,000. Broker Sanchez should inform salesperson Smith that, A, without seller Jones' express permission, salesperson Smith should not have accepted the note. B, buyer Bower must be told that the note will have to be redeemed within five days by cash. C. Buyer Bauer should be told that this offer cannot be presented to Seller Jones. Or D. Seller Jones should be informed prior to acceptance that the deposit is a promissory note. What do you think? D. 
Good. I'm really glad you got this right because this directly relates to a question we did earlier. Okay. Do you remember that question we did about the fiduciary duty in a cold? Yeah. What was that? Did that D stand for in a cold? Disclose. Disclose. And this is very similar to that other question. That other question yeah. was about if they make an oral offer. This all goes along those same lines, though. As a seller, I'm going to tell you, by the way, um, the deposit is nothing more than a promissory note. You're going to want to know that. Because what is a promissory note? It's an IOU, so it's not actually money. It's I owe you money. So promissory note is literally an IOU. So if I wanted to buy your house, right, and you said, great, I need to know you're serious. And then I said, I have a deposit. You're like, awesome. I said, you said how much? $1,000. And then I hand you a piece of paper on a napkin and say, I got to get you $1,000. Is that the same as $1,000? What would you rather have, a thousand dollars cash or a napkin that says I'm going to give you a thousand dollars cash? Oh, okay, I can hear you. Okay, a thousand dollars. Good, good. So let me ask you that again. If I'm going to buy your house and I want to show you I'm serious, and I say I'm giving you a thousand dollars, and I show up with a napkin that says I owe you a thousand dollars, are you okay with that? No. No, and you would want to be informed that it's a promissory note. It's not actual money, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So going back to this question, seller Jones should be informed prior to acceptance that, hey, man, it's not actually a thousand dollars. It's just a piece of paper saying they're going to give you a thousand dollars. Very different. Yeah. I think we're good. What do you think? I, yeah, we're good. OK. So I think we're going to end there for right now. And I okay. hope you learned a lot today, Beverly. Um, what do you think? Did you learn a lot today? Uh, yes, I did. Good. I'm glad. So good luck on your test, and we'll Thank see how you. it goes, and I think you'll do awesome. I think clearly you've been studying a lot. You just need to brush up on a few things, but hopefully learn some strategies, nail down some concepts that will make you good to go for your exam. All right? Okay. So with that being said, this is Joe from Prep Agent. Let me know if you need anything, and good night. Good night. Good night.